Hello, lovers of creative music. I'm Greg Bendy, and this is the podcast. And today I have an old friend joining me to talk about all things musical. He is a bassist, he's a composer, he's a producer, he's an improviser, and he's an all around really interesting, creative type of guy. I'm very happy to welcome him to chat with me today. Hello, Stuart Liebig. Hey, hi. Um, that's quite a um, intro. Thank you. I think you, it all checks out. Yeah, I, it pretty much does. The producer thing I'm sort of went beyond, but um, but I want to say, you know, you've had a lot of really interesting people on this, many of whom are my heroes and some of my mentors. So thank you for having me. Is that right? Uh, who, what, who would that be, Stuart? Who, like heroes? Well, like you, yeah, whatever. Guys, yeah, you guys had you guys you had that guys from XTC. You know, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, those are the ones that, like I said, holy crap. You know, because there was one point in my life when it was like XTC was like. Is gone. that right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, Black Sea and English Settlement. Can I say are the shit? Yeah. I mean, those records. I mean, it was like the kind of thing like we're we would go out and get the English copies, you mm -hmm. know, or finally you get the double the double album. And double. Then, I got, then I had like the, the albums of the EPs and the B-sides. I, I mean, I, you know, and then to me, I've said this, I think I've said this before, like Terry Chambers leaving the band yeah. changed it completely for me. You know, I just think it, he and Colin Molding had this thing and, and I think he really helped drive the tunes in different ways and I think when they started using drum machines and then you know they had a lot of great drummers come through no question but it didn't have quite the same synergy to me you know I mean it's sort of like Ringo leaving the Beatles and then them can carrying on with Alan White or, or you know whoever would have done it you know so Alan White would have been a good choice but yeah I, I take your point Terry Chambers is is a monster he's a master of rhythm and the parts that that he came up with in tandem with Andy Partridge yeah uh, I mean they're classic they're they're so great you know and and sometimes he would just be like so simple and but there was this like little things and and he had a good feel for those tunes like Towers of London you know shit like that or uh, I'm just blanking on the tune, the tune that's like sort of like a weird sort of Mahavishnu trance thing. That that's Travels in Nylon. Yes, thank you. That tune, you know, so it's yeah. just like. Just, I brought that up with Andy because that to me, <laughs> that's like at the end of Revolver, you have Tomorrow Never Knows, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and it's totally one of my favorite songs because it just has this thing or you know there's also a little bit of um she's so heavy on that where it just the, the end of she's so heavy where that there's this like this groove that just goes on and on and then it yeah. just stops i mean just it has this forward momentum you never want to have leave mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. so maybe i just i'd listened to that record recently for the first time in a million years so that's in my mind that album there's yeah. a few yeah. there's a few good <laughs> ones there yeah for sure um yeah but anyway yeah i was super into xtc you know just like they were the the thing so well we had andy we had terry we had dave gregory twice it's been so nice to come second time dave came on to talk about genesis of all things really yeah because he's a big uh, nursery crime fan and so we talked about the 50th anniversary of nursery crime, ah. which he is quite knowledgeable about and has spent a lot of time geeking out on as, sure. you know, so it's, it's, it's a kind of interesting thing to talk about what, what records were important for important artists, you know? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm curious about your, your sort of transformation from a young musician to a mature mu musician like what was your what was your musical direction when you started was it rock and roll was it yeah yeah you know i mean basically um like so many people um of my age um you know it was you know i was a california kid so it was buffalo springfield it was the doors 
you know, it was the Beatles. I was never a huge Stones fan. I kind of like the Mick Taylor era, but that's kind of it for me. Um, but, you know, um, those kinds of things. I was not a Beach Boys fan, uh, but then like, that was sort of like really early, but then also there was a lot of blues stuff. So my good friend, Nick Kirgo, who was in a band and we were both big XTC freaks. Um, we, our parents would take us to the Ash Grove because it was an old ages thing. They'd drive us down in where it's on, what you found Melrose. And we'd go see like Albert King and the Johnny Otis show, Shuggy Otis playing guitar and occasionally, you know, um, uh, Doc Watson, um, you know, just all these different people, you know, I mean, I'm like sitting six feet away from Albert King is kind of a thing when you're 14. You don't actually know what the hell's, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew something was happening. So that was kind of what I was into. Um, but, you know, the other thing is my mom had been like a semi-pro singer. Mm. She was, she was, uh, she did a lot of uh, like early music, but she also was in this group called the Greg Smith Singers that would do, um, your mom was in the Greg Smith Singers? My mom was in the Greg Smith Singers. So like there's pictures of, of her from rehearsals where she has pictures of Stravinsky and Greg Smith because she was doing the premieres in LA. So- um, Did she record with them? You know, I think there are, but I, I they're not list, you know, they don't list them and I they don't really list know. them individually, yeah. Yeah, you know, so, um, so she, uh, that was really instrumental in my, um, sound world you know what i mean because you know there was there was like you know i'd be hearing hindemith or or you know whatever i you know might be you know she'd take me to rehearsals and i'm playing with my war toys while they're singing in an old church and they're singing palestrina masses you know so this is kind of, and i just hear this stuff wafting mm. so um there is that and then you know stepfather played a little jazz kind of stuff like mingus i guess around the house but mostly it was that's the like really early proto stuff and then, um, you know, then this whole kind of blues thing, which kind of leads into Almond Brothers Band. And I was kind of, I was like, I liked Yes. You know, I liked ELP, you know, and then uh, I'm sure you've talked about this with Alex Klein. You know, there was an ELP gig in LA where Mont Vishnu Orchestra opened up for ELP. And it's like, I walked in an ELP fan, not having a clue who Mont Vishnu Orchestra was. Really, and I walked out Ahmad Vishnu like freak. I mean, you know, so like to the point where I saw them seven times in, in, in the heyday of that band, including that the whiskey where they played at like Santa Monica Civic, which is like a two, I forget how many hundreds of people, maybe thousands fit in. They played that volume at the whiskey and it was like, <laughs> it was really, it was yeah, really yeah. fun, you know, Carlos Santana is walking around the the you know the balcony at the whiskey. Um, so you know um, that was kind of it. Uh, but I was like still like a big James Taylor fan. So you know Lee Sklar was a big hero, and then he's playing in the band the section that's opening for Ma Vishnu. You know, and Lee Sklar is a bad mofo, and that you know then he does the Stratus record. Right. You know, I was a big Stanley Clark fan you know, and Alfonso Johnson and Weather Report, you know. Yes, nobody, not enough people talk about Alfonso Johnson and Weather Report. It, well, that gets into the whole thing, but basically what he was doing with effects, if you look at what he's doing with effects, he's using very orchestrationally. And then if you see, like he didn't like really play all that like really um, fast shit on on the records, but if you see like that live in Copenhagen or Berlin thing, he's playing all these 16th note things that, and fretless before right. Baco right. in that band. Yeah. And I think that that people just sort of erase this stuff because Jocko was a earthquake, you know what I mean? But but he did build upon what Alfonso did before him. He Oh, Jocko did. Yeah, yeah. Jocko sorry. did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, um, but Alfonso, I think, is severely underrated in that band. Um, so, you know, those are all the guys. And then... Um, so when you saw Maha Vishnu open for ELP, and this is a famous, infamous run of gigs, by the way, which I only know about because I've heard the tales from both Jan Hammer and his manager, Elliot Sears, who was the tour manager on that tour. Ah. There were eventually, Ma Vishnu was asked to leave the tour. 
Of course. Because they were, <laughs> they were blowing ELP's audience away. Yeah. And then people were leaving during ELP. Dude. Okay. So again, I'm like thinking like knife edge and, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, and um, I even know. like, I even like pictures, you know, but I like Tarkas. Right. I like all that stuff. <laughs> And Mahavishnu comes out and there's just like this freaking force of nature. And then, you know, ELP is good, but then like Keith Emerson stabbing his organ and it's like, oh, dude, come on now. That's not good. That's not going to wash anymore. That might have been good if those guys didn't open for you and you'd had somebody else. But no, that shit. That's that shit yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, just all the, sort of like the weird ham bony shit just didn't didn't float anymore. So, um yeah but that's what you know that's what i was into did you see uh king crimson at santa monica civic i never saw king crimson no no, no version of king crimson nope how I about didn't. beefheart you know so kmet was this radio station in la and i'm pretty sure that i saw one of those radio station nights where like maybe beefheart was on it and little feet and then a couple of other bands, but you know, it's just sort of like you went there and I'm just, you know, full disclosure, I was a teenager that got stoned a lot when I went to these gigs, right? And so I don't remember what the hell was going. I mean, like, you know, I saw Led Zeppelin on their on the Led Zeppelin 2 tour and I'm not sure I was high, but everybody else was. So I must've gotten, you know, and it was just like, I didn't know. So, you know, all these bands you'd see didn't see Mahavishnu high though. I was, I think I was already a young Puritan at that point. Um, so never saw Crimson. I did see, yes, the, uh, the, um, I think it was the Alan White version of the band. So I think it was, I think it was um, after Yes Songs came out. Mm. And what did you think of Chris Squire? Um, well, you know, I really, okay. So for me, Fragile and Close to the Edge are just like great albums. I, I, you know, the one before that, Yes album, it's like, I guess it's before Wakeman cuts in the band. So it's not the classic thing, but also it doesn't seem like they've gelled. And then Topographic Oceans, I hated it and I still hate it. It's just, this seems like a big mess to me. And maybe it's because I'm more a pop song guy and those other two Yes albums were a little bit more pop songy. So Chris Squire, yeah, he's great. And he was doing some really hip shit. If you listen to the Yes album, he's like using tremolo on the bass and all these weird things, you know, and he's obviously doing the... Um, uh, sometimes I got really annoyed with his sound, particularly when I saw him live. I just, I think he played a P bass for one tune and it was like, oh, I really like that sound much better. But at this point, also, um, my tastes are changing and I might have already started getting into R&B and like listening to Larry Graham and shit like that. So it's it's a little fuzzy to me, you know, and I was always a McCartney fan. So I really like that sound. Didn't, John Paul didn't Jones. Didn't McCartney and Larry Graham both play Rickenbackers though? No, McCartney played, uh, well, early on he played, um, you know, the Hofner, but he's using flat wounds. And I think he's probably using flat ones on the other basses he played, which were both, he plays, used a jazz bass and a Rick. Um, Larry Graham mostly used a jazz bass, but then you see pictures of him playing a box and all this stuff. But I don't think he used a Rick. I, I don't recall seeing that. But, um, but, you know, Chris is playing with full Rico sound, right? Which I don't know the, all the particulars of, but I know that, and he's also using round wounds and he's using a metal pick or something, right? So, it's 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 an amazing sound um but i didn't always love it after a while you know i think it sounds great on those two records i mentioned um but let me mention this not to uh to belabor the point but chris squire was the beneficiary of these remastered yes albums oh i haven't i haven't heard them because yet. What ended up happening was you got a much fuller, richer bass sound. Oh, you actually got low end. <laughs> you got low end. Yeah. There's two pickups, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're able, you're able to get much more of that on these remasters, and so it's the first time I really appreciated sort of his sound. Yeah, but you know the thing about it is like he played some really beautiful lines and. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if it's Heart of the Sunrise. I think it's Heart of the Sunrise. He kind of goes up and he does this 
line down and, and it does it does an echo on it and it was just like that was for me that was just like this sort of revelation and i you know unfortunately i, I don't think it's south side of the sky i think it's part of the sunrise hmm. it's this beautiful ascending line then it comes down and it has this sort of like little wilting it's you know yeah you know i mean he's brilliant you know and to me it's like you can i think you can kind of like get a through point between what McCartney's doing to him and then into Colin Molding, not the sound, but but just sort of some of the approaches that happened. You know, there's that sort of um, a very English thing happening, I think, there. Well, that, I know. like that. And I think what you're pointing out is that they were very musical bass lines so that they could be yeah. followed as lines themselves and yeah. musical lines and, and, and they weren't just functional. Yeah, for sure. And and I and I think that's they 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 bridged that um, they had a wider bandwidth of of what they could do with the instrument where they could either be supportive or they could you know just pump an eighth note or whatever and you know to a to a large degree I think a guy like John Paul Jones also did that like on things like Ramble On the, I mean that the the melody of the bass line really carries the tune that's like a hook of the tune you know uh, I think Led Zeppelin two in particular has a lot of that. Um, uh, you know, Chris, uh, what is it? I'm blanking out his name. Crap. Sorry. The guy in uh, the Grease Band kind of did some of that stuff too. Oh, okay. He played on uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, and I'm just blanking out his name, which is killing me because he's such a great bass player that a lot of people kind of forget about. You know, mm -hmm. another guy who more sort of in the job, Paul Jones, kind of like R&B. English R and B kind of thing. Well, did you play upright at all? I did play upright. Um, so, you know what? I got an upright when I was in high school because I figured I would try to do it, and it had gut strings and it was just a freaking nightmare. And I also started started playing. So I basically, you know, played fretted. Then I got a fretless when I was about sixteen. Uh, <laughs> contrary to what Jeff Berlin says, not everybody plays fretless because of Jocko. I got mine before I even, you know, 1972, before I ever knew who he was, because I saw it in a Fender catalog and because Rick Danko played fretless and I read that Alfonso Johnson was getting a fretless. Right. Um, so, um, so I had a, an upright, but I didn't, it was more sort of like me just trying to figure it out. And I, I think I ended up buying an Engelhardt and putting a pickup, but it was just crap. Oh, so strangely, now you're reminding me of this, I used to get together with John Beasley every Sunday with a drummer and we would like play like McCoy Tyner tunes and stuff like that. So I was good enough to play with John when I was 18 and he was 16. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is pretty funny. So um, yeah, I kind of did that, but then I, I stopped doing it partially because I ended up going on the road, you know, um, when I was just when I was turning 20, I was 19. Um, and so I was playing rhythm guitar of all things. You know about this? No. Oh, okay. So uh, my girlfriend got in, or an ex-girlfriend got involved with this communal living group and they would like have these sort of like Wednesday night or Thursday night uh, dinners and jam sessions. Les McCann is part of this thing. So I go in and there's this girl playing bass and I'm going like, well, she's playing bass. She's not particularly good, but you know, whatever. Um, but I've been playing a little bit of guitar. So I just figured oh, I'll play guitar. So Les at one point has me um, come in and do a, a session for a song. And I'm playing both bass and guitar, both terrible, mind you. Um, it ends up on the album. So eventually, uh, he goes, hey, you want to come out and, and be on the road crew? You're, you know, me and the road manager basically for the summer. And I go, yeah, sure, why not? And he goes, well, I'll bring your guitar or something. I go, yeah, I'm always bringing an instrument, no big deal. So the first day we get in, the first day we drive to, um, he's flying and me and the road manager are driving. We drive to Kansas City or Lawrenceville, Kansas, somewhere like maybe, anyway, so, um, we're there and he goes, hey, we're going to this music store, come with us and going like, okay, sure. He goes, yeah, check out the amp. Okay, yeah, that's nice. Check out this amp. Okay, yeah, sure. Which one do you like? I don't know. He goes, you need to tell me because you're playing through it tonight. And that was my, um, I never rehearsed with the band. 
he just puts me on stage. I'm sure the other two guys, the other three guys in the band are going, who the hell is this guy? Um, and part of this end, ended up being that I was always super defensive throughout the whole situation and probably not the best bandmate. Um, but anyway, so I kind of learned a couple tunes uh, on the fly. And then I think I rehearsed with him one day. But um, the lasting thing, the lasting memory of that gig is we're sitting there and I don't know, it feels like it's a discotheque or something, you know, I'm complete no, I'm just a uh, deer in the headlights. And I just remember a lot of mirrors and this waitress brings up this big glass of water to less. And I'm going like, damn, I'm parched. Hey man, can I have a sip of your water? He goes, yeah, sure. Pure vodka. <laughs> so I take this big swig and he just looks around and he goes, <laughs> he just starts cracking up. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my uh three-year tenure with Les. Um and you know he's a he's a great musician. He's not a schooled musician necessarily. He did do some schooling, but that's not his forte in my view. He's just this time's badass, he's soulful, his feel is amazing, and he imparted some real nuggets of wisdom to me and you know, I, I, um, I loved the guy, you know, and even though he, he and I don't always, I haven't seen him for a long time. He's in bad health, but, um, you know, he likes to grind me when I see him. So I don't, sometimes it's hard for me to deal with that, but, um, you know, great. Well, those great early, early 20 gigs, you know, those are, those are formative gigs. They are, you know, and I was really lucky. I was extremely lucky to do that. Um, you know, I don't, you know, you probably shouldn't have had me in the band, but, but anyway, um, yeah, my friend Nick ended up being that band, the guy who I was going to all these like Allman Brothers gigs and, and we were playing from early on. He ended up being in that. And then we added a band called Huge Killer Bats, which we sort of did our little bit but faux XTC thing. And then we were in a band called Block with Nels and this guy, Chris Manchinelli and Camille Henry. So there was a long throughput of 20 odd years of doing that. But anyway, so I went on the road and then eventually I just said, I'm, I'm done with this. I don't like playing guitar. And um, I went back to school, a guy who is um, one of my main music teachers. At, I went to kind of like a hippie free school. So one of our teachers was like, sort of like a guitar player guy. He was like 23 and he ended up having us come on to gigs with him. So that was like my first gigging thing when I was like 16 or whatever. I'm playing with these older guys and it was great. You know, I learned a lot. Um, but anyway, he is, he's the guy who turned me on to jazz. He's the guy who turned me on to Penderecki, you know, and he goes like, yeah, you should come to Northridge and go to school here. You need to take music history from George Skopsky, who was just like struck fear into everybody. Um, and, you know, learn, learn about all this because I wanted to like learn orchestral music. So that, that's when I kind of like really started playing upright for a while. And I was in the orchestra, I got to be third chair, which meant that the really good people had already left. So I somehow moved up, but you know, I, I got a decent sound and, you know, it went from like, my audition was, you shouldn't even be doing this. You should just leave to like, yeah, that was the best senior recital we've seen in years. So you know, I kind of, I kind of got my fu into them for being dicks to me when I did that, and I, I kind of proved something to myself, and I got a lot of information from, you know, I took from two different, I took from a guy who's an LA studio guy and composer, uh, a guy who was one of the co-principals at LA Phil, and then the guy who really set me right with this guy who was um, the principal of the LA Chamber Orchestra named Ed Mears, and he. I got so much from him because, you know, phrasing, vibrato, all this stuff that doesn't really always happen on electric bass. Right. You know, um, you know a lot of guys have really nervous vibrato and, and you know, I, he kind of like really keyed me into all these things and like really playing phrases and all this stuff, which I really hadn't done so much. I mostly come from the blues rock kind of, you know, fusion-y kind of thing. And that was particularly when I was young, that was more just like, I'm gonna play, as opposed to I'm gonna try to play something with shape. So that that was, that was sort of answers your question about the upright. <laughs> I think it was sort of circuitous, but, um, but then I got out of college and I just said, 
I graduated and I said, okay, I can get a master's and I'm seeing all these people who are really good and they're becoming like eighth chair in San Diego, right? Or some other, or I can start a rock band. <laughs> what did I do? I started a rock band, you know? So, that, and that's, um, you know, I already known like Nelson, Alex and those guys for seven, well, you wanna know how I met Nels? Yeah, sure. I'm just talking. You can tell me to shut up anytime. Okay, so uh, John Beasley's dad was Rule Beasley, and he was the guy who ran the Santa Monica College Jazz Band. And, you know, the thing was, you went in to do that. If you were in, you know, that's who you wanted to do. Rule Beasley left the year I went in there, but I get in there, and there are these two guys sitting there. One's Nels Klein, and one's Michael Preussner. Now, Michael and Nelson known each other from uni, but they're both there. And it's like, yo, okay. And so we would like jam in between things. And pretty soon we're doing this stuff. And then, um, you know, he's got this band ring with Alex and, and, and Brian Horner, which I never went and saw because I was actually like going to school and gigging at this point. So I'm not going out to gigs. Um, but then this guy, Dorian, um, he, John Rapson and Wayne Pete and a guy named John Stevens had this band called the Joe Doppler Quartet or something like that, even though it's like six people. And they asked um, Dorian to play bass and he says, no, you should get Stuart to play bass on it. So that's how I met Wayne. Uh, and then eventually I'm sitting there playing with Wayne at the Century City Playhouse and here's Nels and these guys, right? And and actually the other thing about it is, is that um, I had come back, I'd come back from the road and I'd like, they had like this sort of legend, Nelson and Alex sort of had this legendary like 4th of July jam and that's how I met Vinny. And of course I'm just scared crapless because all these guys are making records and I, you know, Vinny Golia. Of, Vinny Golia, you know, Alex is sort of like a deity because he's in my view, because he's um, done a duo record with somebody, you know, so you know, all, all these guys and I'd heard Vinny play with Alex and Roberto. So all of a sudden I'm, you know, getting, thrown into this thing and being like I'm in the deep end you know um yeah I never really knew how you came into to being involved with all those guys through a really weird set of <laughs> circumstances like I said you know I meet Wayne through this guy Dorian I meet you know Nelson at Santa Monica and then all this other stuff so that's kind of that's how how that happened you know and were you musically simpatico yet or did that take a process or a bit of a while um well so you know <laughs> i have to back up some more i keep i keep kind of so my other theory teacher was this guy dean drummond who is oh, a harry okay. marsh disciple yeah yeah wow yeah okay you want to hear a good this is a good story for me so our the other there was two theory teachers the first one was a guy named, there was Dorian and there was a guy named Frank. Now Frank's kind of like one of my classmates like guitar teachers and he maybe does a couple of studio things, but he decides he's gonna leave. So they hired Dean. So the first day Frank is introducing Dean and he goes, well, you know, I've been teaching the kids about jazz, you know, like, you know, not that bad stuff like Ornette Coleman and stuff like that. And Dean goes, that's my favorite stuff. And we're going like, Okay, so, you know, um, Dean is, is at S, uh, UCLA, and, um, you know, we go over to his place, and he's showing us the instruments he's building, and, you know, he's telling us about Harry Parch, so, you know, they, at one point at Royce Hall, they did uh, Delusion of the Fury, and so we all went and saw that, and of course, wow. it turns out that, that, you know, and Dean's like on the cover somewhere of that Danley Mitchell record. He's, I, I forget where it is, but anyway, so, you know, of course, it's one of those things where like you start talking to people later on in life in LA and they're going like, oh yeah, I was at that gig. There's so many people I know, we all sort of like had this sort of thing happening or people who were at the Ma Vishnu gig, all these things where there's just like, yeah, I was there and now we're doing this. So, right. Um, so yeah, you know, and then when I'm on the road with Les, I'm um, I'm picking up Anthony Braxton albums in in uh, in Boston, 
you know, so I'm going home and listening to those. So uh, yeah, starting to be musically simpatico even before that. So I kind of found my tribe, you know what I mean? And yeah, so that's what it was. It was sort right. of already brewing. And I right. think those guys are a few years older than you, right? No, no Nelson, Alex are six months older than me. Oh. Wayne, Wayne's, yeah, they're 56 babies in January and I'm a 1956 July baby. Oh. So yeah. So they just seem more mature than me. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. So, um, you know, Vinny's quite a bit older. Uh, right. Quite a bit. He's older. Uh, so is GE. Um, right. And uh, Wayne's somewhat older. So, you know, a couple of years older. And then, of course, you and I have the secret trio recording with Wayne. Yeah. On organ. <laughs> yeah. And I think I think I talked to him about this. You know, Wayne's just he's swamped and you know, he's other things but i think he might have fixed the bass drum problem yeah know. he did and, okay. and we have the tracks okay good what to, what to do with them remains the question but uh well band camp <laughs> you well, know he's put it well, out there you know yeah. i mean uh yeah i don't know but you know i mean the, the difference between those guys and me was that um I was doing like top 40 gigs and disco gigs. Like I'm on a, I'm like on a, on a disco single from a band in Pacoima, you know, that, that actually got re-released on some English anthology of weird disco tunes. Um, you know, so I, I had, um, you know, like we played, uh, I was in a top 40 band that played loner of an only heart, or, you know, you know, just, you know, just for the weird yes thing. Um, or not, yes, depending on your point of view about that record. But, you know, um, but, you know, um, you know, with those guys, like, I don't think Alex is super into a lot of pop stuff, but, you know, I liked the police. I loved XTC, you know, I, um, I liked the English beat. I was kind of like really into all that stuff. Nels was kind of like into that, but he was probably more into the punk sort of thing about it. Uh huh. Yeah. So, but you know, none of those guys are playing. Like, I get, I would get calls like, "Hey, come, what are you doing right now? Nothing. You come down to Culver City and play a country gig for like two hours and make, you know, at that point, twenty five bucks or something." So I'd just watch the guitar players and and play this stuff, you know. So I I had a really different um, my that part of my formative part of my twenties was very different, you know. So. Um, yeah, we we there's simpatico, but there's also like some major, I think, life differences in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, I was I was you know work sort of working musician in college. You know, I was like doing, you know, weddings and bar mitzvahs. You know, to make so you little... weren't composing yet. No, um, I had sort of illusions that I wanted to, but I didn't really. Um, what really started me on that was that I kind of wanted to do it, but, um, I realized I was starting a little bit later, but I would sit there during orchestra rehearsal, like pictures at an exhibition, right? Ravel. There's a lot of times that the bass players aren't playing anything. So I'd be sitting there with the score following along. So that's the kind of thing I was, I, so my, my thing about composition was I took a couple comp classes, but they were more like 101 or, you know, maybe zero, zero, 001. Um, a lot of what I got into was I had a really good theory teacher who taught us how to analyze stuff. So, you know, like analyze Weber and, you know, and like what's going on, you know, motivically and, and structurally and all that stuff. And um, I did a lot of self-study on that. Like I analyzed a bunch of Beethoven string quartets and I got, you know, back there, you can't see them, but I just have a bunch of scores that I would like read along and I'd, you know, listen to them and go like, oh, that's what's going on, you know, and you, you kind of like start hearing this stuff. And that's, that's how I really, uh, you know, and then there's some Stravinsky stuff, not so much, it was more like the symphony and C and symphony and three movements that are very sort of like the structure, the, the form is kind of blocky and he kind of like, cute kind of, form. what's it called? Moment form. Oh, never heard that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I just think of it as well, like it's just, like, it's like just uh, kind of filmic cuts from from thing to thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but but done really so really well. Is also like that. There there's a few pieces like that. Yeah, and and so I would I kind of got into the uh, I I I really was interested in those types of things, you know. Um, so uh, like that album Pomegranate has a lot of that in it, where I I, I was really trying to trying to tell a story, but by, but I also like breaking the story up and having not everything be the same form, you know, because I, I feel like um, sometimes people use the same forms more than I would like to hear them use them. Does that make sense? I'm trying to be nice about this. <laughs> well, yeah, people get into templates and things. I'm glad you brought up Pomegranate because shout out to my producer, Matt Stober. He said, I'm a big fan of Stuart Liebig's Pomegranate album. Make sure you ask him about it. Well, okay. Okay. Well, over. okay so uh, you want to know about Pomegranate? <laughs> yeah, go. Okay. Well, um, you know, Jeff Godey and I have a long association. He was in this band Quarteto Stig. And then he was in a, um, I broke that band up um, and I started doing the Mentones and this other band called Lane Inns Merge Left. Lane Inns Merge Left was Alex, Jeff, me, and at first it was Eric Barber, but then Eric Barber left, and then it was a uh, town to, to go back up north to Oregon, and then um, Andrew Pass played in it. And so I had this, I had this thing, and Jeff's going like, well, I'd like you to do an album for Cryptogramophone. By the way, do you know who named Cryptogramophone? You. I did. Most people don't know that, but I'm glad you did. Okay. So anyway, because Jeff's going like, what? I need a name. I'm going like, well, I was thinking about if I ever did an album, uh, a, a label, I'd go call it Cryptogramophone. He goes, oh, I like that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that Alex thought it was a good name, but. Um, well, you got credit for it. I know it was definitely told to me. Okay, good. Because because sometimes I think that it's like, uh, I, want, I want some cred for that. Um, anyway, yeah. so. It's so anyway, so um, Jeff says, I'd like you to do an album. I said, well, how about this? He goes, yeah, I want to do something different. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to think grandiose. How about we do this? I have these people I'm playing with that I like playing with. We'll make them a band and then I'll bring in some soloists. And the soloists I'd like to have are Tom Varner, because I was into Tom's writing and playing, Mark Dresser, and then Vinny and Nell. So we have like the sort of New York and LA thing happening. And um, I was lucky people said yes, and they were enthusiastic about it. And, you know, I think it was the second most expensive record that they'd done in cryptogramophone at that point. <laughs> Jeff reminded me of that a couple of times. Um, and, you know, I'm, I think it's pretty good work, you know? It, it came out right like after 9-11. So it kind of, if there was gonna be any cred, you know, any, um, uh, people paying attention to it, somehow a national catastrophe kind of erased that possibility. Yeah, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because it's the 20th anniversary of Requiem for Jack Kirby. Right. So it's the 20th anniversary for Pomegranate. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I was on tour with Nels and Alex Klein and Kermit Driscoll promoting oh, God. Requiem in the week after 9-11 so we toured and i write about this in the we just reissued this and it's on Bandcamp. yeah uh we just reissued it with original liner notes and original artwork and some new essays for requiem uh for jack kirby andy partridge wrote one. Oh, nice and mike keneally wrote one but yeah it was um it was a a weird time to put an album out and try to get noticed because everyone was wondering what's the, you know, is the second shoe going to fall and like what, what's going to happen next. And so we're on the road traveling, driving th through America in the weeks after nine 11. Wow. That, I mean, to me at that point, I was just kind of going, well, what, you know, I mean, first off, my kids were six when that happened and mm -hmm. I, you know, my wife's calling me and I'm watching it and I'm just going like, Oh, I'm looking at my kids thinking like, oh, World War Three, and I'm just, yeah, sure. I, I was really, you know, it was, it was a messed up thing. And I just, I, music felt kind of like superfluous at that point to me. Yeah. I had a lot of friends who said, no, it's not. I'm going like, okay, well, 
Well, event. I wrote about this this idea too that it was a kind of cathartic thing to be able to go out and have a tour after that. Right on. Yeah, I can see you know, that. It was a bit of a therapeutic experience because we weren't sitting at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I definitely was. So I got to I got to wallow in the in the morass. And you yeah, guys yeah, it was a crazy time. Yeah. So um, but here, here's a, a an unknown nugget is that I had planned to do a follow-up to pomegranate. Mm. And um, <clears throat> one of the people I wanted was was Wayne. The other one I was going to ask Michael Moore from uh, Amsterdam because he's a friend of friends and I, you know, and the other was you. I wanted you to do like the marimba, you know, I wanted that happening. So um, unfortunately that never happened, but little nugget that probably, I actually ended up writing the one for Wayne because we when we did a 50th birthday concert for me, we did, um, I think, I can't remember it was Nelson's and Vinny's or, and then this piece I wrote for Wayne and then two pieces I wrote for Jeff's band with, with a wind ensemble, sort of like pomegranate adjacent but you know it was, it was a thing for uh the the quartet with joel hamilton alex klein dave Witham, and and um you know they played the shit out of it dave really played the shit out of it oh my god i had the pleasure of of subbing in that band for alex oh yeah wow well the go tet with with, with right, right. Uh, when they came to new york and then you were on around for that oh time. oh that was that was the uh the crypto um uh residency at, at um the stone there. yes right yeah God, that's years ago. <laughs> like it feels like a lifetime ago <laughs> i forgot that that you had done that yeah. yeah, there's um, there's a lot of interesting sort of tendrils that 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 go back and forth between New York and and LA and yeah, in, in our little circle and uh, you know the fact that that we have this band Bone Structure that's recorded a cryptogramophone record actually started in New York as the GE Stinson Quartet at the old at the Small Knitting Factory or whatever it was called at that yeah. Point. Yeah. So, you know, there was always this, uh, I feel like there was a, a good back and forth give and take. Yeah. Particularly around that time. And that they really, the scenes were different. The sort of the approaches to, to the music were different, but in my view, compatible. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, but Tim Byrne had done like records out here with, with, um, you know, Alex and Nels for sure. And I can't yep. remember who else is on it, you know. So, you know, it seemed like like that was happening. And, and um, you know, we we didn't talk about the Julius Hemphill thing, but, um, you well, know. We, sh we sure should, because I believe that you are on the current Julius Hemphill box set, right? Yep. The, the job band is on one cut. I think Alex is all over that record. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we did, there's one cut of us. I still haven't listened to it just because just because of my whole life recently. I, I just haven't wanted to listen to it yet. So, yeah. you know, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, that was really great experience. And, you know, thank you, Alex, for, you know, recommending me, you know, there's a funny story about that too. Please. So, you know, we play this thing. Well, uh, get the call go up to go up and we're going to play yoshi's i guess this is the julius hemphill jaw band this is a jaw band and i walk in and you know um hi julius he goes allegedly and then he starts telling me well you know this isn't a jazz gig and i'm going like well, what does that mean does that mean i'm not doing walking bass right what is that this is not jazz mean right? i guess that means i'm not doing walking bass so we play the gigs and um, then I think, and I don't know who they use, but he, he did another, another job band, at least one gig without me. And Alex says, hey man, so what happened to Stuart? He goes, well, he doesn't walk. He goes, dude, you told him it's not a jazz gig. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I can, I can 
I can do walking bass lines. So then uh, I ended up being back in the band again, you know, and um, that was a great band, you know, the, um, and I, I always say the one that got away was the Frizzell band because I know somewhere there's a live tape of us in, in Ljubljana in Yugos, former Yugoslavia. And I just remember being on stage that night just going, holy crap. It well, was, this is Nels and Bill? Nels and Bill. And there's actually, there's actually like a, a cassette of somebody in the audience listen, doing, listening to this shit. And it's just, it's like Dogon is industrial noise, funk, conflagration. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. You know, Bill's like at his sort of most fiery, you know, Nels is, you know, really come, starting to come into his own. Like, the, I think he would tell you that he doesn't like what he did on that first job band record, though I think it sounds really good. But I think he doesn't feel like he's really getting to where he wants to be. Um, okay. You know, I think that's, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I, I feel like that, that that's what he would say or he has told me one of those. Nels, if you hear this and I'm wrong, just put it in the comments, tell me to F off. <laughs> just timestamp it. <laughs> he doesn't watch this show. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience and, you know, Julius was very generous, you know, with, with um, letting us do our thing, you know, and going, going kind of crazy and, you know, putting up with, with, well, me occasionally, <laughs> so. Well, it's an interesting period too, right? Because at this time, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is uh, 88, when is this? I think this is 84 through 87 or so. Okay, and this is also around the time of prime time. This is around the time of a lot of, yeah, you know, sort of out stirred jazz guys right electric yeah yeah the slickophonics i think was was one of them you know i think even halias was playing uh electric bass at that yeah point. you know yeah for sure there were a few james blood almer yeah for sure so um yeah I, you know i mean julius seemed to have his r&b roots so he sure did well you know. yeah and, and such an underrated composer oh yeah yeah, well, this, this is one of those kind of tragic things, you know, and maybe he wasn't always his, his, um, his best, uh, I don't know how to say this. I think probably he, he could have done better by himself is what I'm trying to say, you know. So I don't know, either that or, you know, there's only so much uh, bandwidth for people to enjoy music of this nature and they have to glom onto certain names and then those guys become the guys and everybody else sort of is on the is orbiting does that make sense you know well world saxophone quartet was successful although yeah. you know he didn't remain in it uh and i think he's just underrated as a as a figure yeah in the new jazz yeah Along with Braxton and Threadgill and and Moon Hall Richard Abrams and uh, you know anyone else you want to add to that group David Murray I mean uh, Julius Hempel is a huge figure yeah but he didn't quite have like the uh, the cachet of, of like Braxton or the Art Ensemble or something like that and that's what I guess I'm trying to say is that 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 those people coalesce around that and then other people sort of seem like more orbital to people. I'm not saying that's reality. I'm just saying that, that the perception is like, oh, these, these guys are the shit, you know, and that becomes a, a big focus. And, you know, it's not, um, it's not wrong to think that the art ensemble <laughs> was a big focus, you know what I'm saying? I do. I know that situation very well. So, so, so let me ask you this, what, uh, what would people find if they went to your band camp? Because I know that you put a lot of material up and share a lot of material. So tell people about that. Well, it, it, it's a mess because I've, I've done a bunch of different things. Um, you know, I did a whole set of sort of strange electronica records. Uh, one was based on um, 
like waking up every night and having few like just few dreams going on you know and like trying to trying to express that um different things like that just me experimenting with ableton and trying to come up with glitchy stuff there's an album or two really one good part of it uh based on William Gibson science fiction writing and his world. Uh, I did a whole series of like once a month, I just did four days in a row of improv stuff as sort of like I called, you know, base diary sort of thing. And it's just different things. So, um, <clears throat> you know, weird records where I'm doing solo bass where I'm playing variations on uh, standards plus kind of noisier stuff. Um, just all over the place. I mean, I play upright on one thing where it's all, it's all kind of like weird drum machine stuff with um, synthesizers and, and double bass, strangely, you know? <clears throat> so uh, it's kind of all over the map, you know? It's not, um, uh, <laughs> it's a, right now I'm working on, on like, you know, desktop modular stuff. Cause I just sort of got interested in trying to do, so I'm just, in certain ways, I look at this more as like little sonic projects, not like I'm not writing for ba bands right now because well, I had been writing. I had two bands that I was going to do before the pandemic. <laughs> you know, I had rehearsals. I had I had the money put together for the albums. You know, I had gigs. And, but, you know, I was going to do the second Mentot 6 record, which was going to be I, sort of a breakthrough for me compositionally. Shit was hard, but I was going to do a um, that that band Minim I did, you know, the band Minim I did, Minim I did. Thank you. Well, Minim. Minim. It's sort of, it's sort of like um, how to put this. The instrumentation on the first record is uh, vibraphone and drums, uh, violin with Jeff. Um, Ellen Burr playing flute and me playing electric bass, mostly high strung electric bass. Drummer, uh, percussionist is Jeanette Kangas. So um, I did 23 little miniatures of varying things. Like this is sort of my answer to pomegranate, which are big long pieces, uh, small, like, like seven quartets, you know, three trio, you know, four trios. I mean, basically I broke them up into components. Everybody gets a solo. So it's sort of trying to get this um, group of miniatures that has sort of a, almost some, a little bit of a palindromic form to it. Um, second one was Brad Dutz on hand percussion or like his percussive setup in marimba. And then uh, Sarah Schoenbeck on bassoon and Andrew Pascoe on clarinet and bass clarinet and me on high strung bass. So, and it's sort of a, a, a similar thing. So the next, this last thing I was gonna do was gonna be Vicki Ray, Maggie Parkins, um, Brianna Gilcher. <laughs> and me. And um, she, Brianna plays English horn and oboe. So I'd, I had most of the music written, we had a gig and then gig canceled and, you know, but uh, so basically I sort of had this, these sort of like small chamber groups. That yeah. Um, and then, you know, the men, the men taught, the men tone T taught experience becoming the men taught six thing. And then, this crazy record that I wrote that's we got through one rehearsal and I was waiting for Scott Ray to come back from Montana because <laughs> that's where he lives and then um try to record it and you know yes it's a familiar tale of abrupt changes everybody we know <laughs> or almost everybody we know you know so and we try to find ways to carry on yeah you know um and yeah, being self-contained is pretty big right now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Being For creative sure. now in the face of so much adversity is a good idea right now. Yeah, you know, and then maybe maybe it gives you a chance to, you know, learn a couple other things, like go in a slightly different direction. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I kind of feel like, uh, particularly not just the pandemic, but the way my life has gone this last year, that I kind of feel like I have a, a a new starting point in a way, you know. And and what I don't know what that means, you know. But it, but it feels like the old world's gone, you know, for numerous reasons. Um, so yeah, I've been writing slower music. Ah, you know, I've just been been enjoying 
long tones way more uh, than mm -hmm. I ever have. As someone who's written a lot of frantic music, you know, this coming on out the other side of this situation, it definitely has uh, made me hear things at a slower rate. So is that like, uh, um, well, I want to ask technical questions about it. Is that like, uh, like slow counterpoint, like kind of like, you know, for lack of a better term, like Renaissance kind of music or is it no, more? No, um, actually it's pretty droney ambient. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. With, you know, motifs and melodies and, and uh, oboe and voice and uh, bowed vibraphone and nice uh, guitar so so it's it's really what was, the last, what was the last one guitar is that you said yeah okay and some it's the second of uh album by this project i have with matt stober called made of water hmm. and the first one was a little bit of the ambient thing but a lot more uh angular sure stuff and um I think we're both sort of in a place now where there's no rules because that doesn't matter, you know? I mean, it kind of like, you just might as well do the, the things you want to hear. Yeah. And put them on a record and say, this is what my band is now, uh, you know, hope you like right. it, but this is what I'm into. Yeah, there, there's, um, there's sort of like the abyss and then there's the opportunity of the abyss, you know? Um, so, but when you say record, do you mean like literally printing up CDs or do you mean, well, I mean, it's a bad you, habit. I say record. It's a project. Right, right. Well, but see, this is the thing. It's like, there's certain, there's certain projects like this Minim thing and the Mentot 6, we're going to be CDs. And I know people say it's a dinosaur, but trust me, in another five years, all these kids who are growing up and watching their older brothers and sisters or moms and dad being old vinyl fetishists are going to go like, oh, CDs, they were the cool thing. They're going to, oh, they're going to be nostalgia about CDs. Oh, you think CDs are coming back? I think they will come back just because like who, who thought vinyl was going to be a thing? Oh, you have a very interesting point there, Stuart. You know, I mean, cassettes are a thing. Like we're going to put, you know, somebody wants to put out, a, you know, we, well, Nathan and, and Vinny and I did a tour and Nathan Hubbard, San Diego. I know Nathan. Really well. I'm telling you, I'm telling our, our viewers. <laughs> so. Our viewers is uh, Nate Hubbard is a percussionist. Comp yeah, composer, uh, polymath in, in the music world, like yes, does like trip hop records and hip hop records. And he and I have a, a duo where we do complete electronica and it's just it's but improvised and so it can either be like really mellow or just like nuts or hip hoppy. But anyway, um but he's going like, yeah, we should put out a cassette. I'm thinking like and I know people put out cassettes, but it's sort of like they sounded bad. <laughs> yeah, right. So so you're kind of then looking at um lo-fi, which is a thing now too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So people are getting back into cassettes. I had a student recently ask me how I felt about a track. And I uh, I had no reason to to think that there'd be any resurgence of a track. It was not, I said, it basically wasn't built for the form of music I was listening to where in the middle of a Tommy Boland solo on, you know, spectrum <laughs> to flip over to the next track, you know, thanks. Well, very helpful. A track. So did you ever have an, you had an eight track then, right? I had the experience. Yes. So I got, you know, my mom gave me some like lawn jeans or whatever. Thing, yeah. 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 And it had an eight track in it. Right. So I was listening to things like um, after the gold rush or whatever, but, and it's like, I want to hear that song again. You can't do it. You have to like fast forward. You can't just pick up the needle and do it. Even a cassette you can rewind, but that thing you have to go through all four, all four things and then listen to the first tune or second tune or third or whatever, before you get to the song you want to listen to worst, worst medium ever. Oh my God. How would you, that's a conspiracy, if you, you ask me. <laughs> you want to you want to talk about technological, you know, conspiracy theories. How the hell did they push through the eight track for commercial use? It's just something that doesn't smell right to me. About well, that. it didn't last long. No, you got to get that you know, I mean, it 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 must have died in a couple of years. Yeah, at most. But God, but you see, this is the thing. It's like all of a sudden there's this weird nostalgia. 
about and, and really you did you grow up with, with vinyl yes okay well you're a little younger than me i don't know how much younger than me, i'm but you know, um seven years younger than you okay so you know i just remember like like there's a beatles song that every time i hear it now i wait for the click in the middle of the guitar solo because when i got my my brand new copy of the white album with the serial number and all that crap on it when they first put it there was manufactured in, into my copy there was a skip in the middle of the guitar solo on on uh um, back in the ussr so every time i hear that i'm waiting for the click <laughs> you know it just yeah, it, I, I don't have nostalgia about it i don't have nostalgia for vinyl you know? i want to hear everything as clearly as possible i don't I don't have too much, I don't know. I don't have a big problem with digital. I, I don't have a big problem with, uh, the biggest problem I have is when there's noise on top of the music. And if that's the, yeah. the, 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 the record or if that's tape hiss, I don't yeah. love it, but I'm not such a fan of vinyl as much as I miss the album covers. Yes. And, and that's then then you start getting that down into like, mp3s and streaming and you don't get any of the information of, it's, it's horrible for jazz play jazz oh, or play bullshit. so like i you know i was when cds first came out i was like ah you know no. you know and i read all these things about it and i didn't want to like it and then a friend of leslie's was selling a cd player so we got one and i've been listening i've been like following like a I forget what Mahler piece was. Either like maybe the first symphony or uh, some other thing that starts with a low A drone or something like that. And I, I'm looking at the score and going like I'm not hearing this on vinyl, right? Put it on the CD. It's like oh, there it is. There yeah. it is. I can hear all that nuance. And then I'm like, oh, well, rock and roll is not. It's no. Nah, it's that. It's you know maybe maybe jazz and classical. And rock's going to be better on vinyl. Somebody gave me Led Zeppelin too. Is like. Nope, sounds better. <laughs> well, you, you know, you can argue about the CD delivery format, but everything's on there. I mean, the, when I say everything, I just mean frequency range. Yeah, it's pretty complete. I know people will say we can. There are frequencies that we're not hearing, and it, it's a whole. Sure. Yeah, but there's but frequencies honestly, you're not hearing on vinyl too. You're not hearing bass frequencies. That's correct. We're talking about Chris Squire and this shit being remastered. And somebody was saying, "How come I can't hear bass on certain recordings?" It was mastered for a for a vinyl record where they couldn't put the bass on it. They couldn't. They couldn't include it. It would pop out. It would bump up the the stylus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what what are you working on now, Stuart? Well, like I said, I'm working on this sort of strange sim uh, this desktop semi modular thing. I got some stuff just because I. I've been sort of intrigued by it. Um, and um, <sighs> it gets into some, I'm trying to figure out how to explain what I'm trying to do. Um, well, first off, um, I've been listening to a little P Pierre Henri. And so I I'm not, completely sold on everything he does but i'm sort of interested in the sound universe and i'm kind of in more interested in sonics rather than pitch or pitch that's less referential to um to scales so for instance um some of the things i did recently before this project i would i was put because some of the synthesizers i have can do microtonal stuff so i've been putting microtonal clouds coming in and out of Tarmony. And mostly it's it's just, I, I haven't worked it out. It's mostly just me hearing it. So I'm, I'm much more into sort of like just, just um, hearing the sonics of it rather than planning every pitch. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it, it's, it's more, um, it's, at a certain point, I'm taking a lot of my cues from painters right now. So like Gerhard Richter, who I think is a really interesting painter. If you, if you, there's a, really interesting i think um video called richter painting and it, and it shows him doing one of his big scrapey pieces 
fascinating from my perspective as an improviser or somebody who's sort of using codified improvisations and then cutting them up and putting them into pieces of music. So, which leads me into sort of what I'm doing is I'm doing some things where I'm taking uh, like small sequences and some of them are really slow. I mean, in certain ways it's sort of serialism. Some of them are really slow. So you just get like this big like FM kind of like singular note hit. And then some are really fast or some are, you know, really high. And then I'm kind of like placing them in space in, in and in a, um, both a, a, a time space and a, a spatial stereo field. This sounds really erudite, but it's, it's not that exciting. Um, so I'm kind of like trying to get flow with that. And then some of them I have different sequences going against each other um, and then cutting them up. And so I'm getting more blocks of sound. I guess I like that blocks of sound thing. Um, and, uh, but then I'm also having like the small chordal things come in with, again, these sort of quarter tone things coming up underneath them or juxtaposed against them or coming out of them. So I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in this thing right now where some of it's sort of pitch and some of it's sort of uh, not equal temperament pitched. And, yeah. then some, and sometimes the overlap of those. So, you know, whether or not it sounds any good, I don't know. You know when I can we hear some of it? Uh, well, some of the pieces that I did earlier um, with, with just the quarter tones coming in and out of stuff, I've already put up on Bandcamp. The problem with my Bandcamp thing is it's like, it's chronological. Everything at the top is what I was doing in 2009. And you get down to the bottom and that's when you get into, <laughs> into, into the um, more current stuff. I, sh I need to work out a different, I just sort of started doing it and then I just, I added on to it. Um, these things, I don't know. I have three pieces of about six, seven minutes long. And I don't know if I'm gonna do four or five. I kind of always figure it out in the middle of it. You know, yeah. how long, you know I, I, I like to have things that juxtapose. So a lot of things I do are maybe multi uh, movement, so to speak, where they, uh, you know, like the first thing and this thing is slow. The second thing is, is a little bit faster. That third thing's faster. Now I'm kind of thinking about something that's slow, but it's not droney, it's more percussive. So I, I, I look for, for um, like I say, juxtaposition of, of, of ideas. Well, you also mentioned painters. And I wonder, do you have uh, synesthesia? Do you see music when you listen to music? Do you see color? Do you see texture? No, no I don't. I, um, how did, I, I have a visual component to how I, I write music but not like but not not written notes i, I kind of like see blocks of and i, I kind of imagine blocks of sound so so to me it's 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 um it's not literally visual but it's sort of sort of visual a lot of it's conceptual and some of the some of that becomes visualizations of ideas mm. if that makes any sense I've done a lot of painting, of painter pieces where I base things on like Rothko or Pollock or Klein, that kind of thing, you know, uh, Cliff Still. So um, that's like, interesting uh, to me because I, at one point, was doing a lot to do with painters as well. Uh, Arsho uh, Gorky had a percussion piece called uh, Drum Rolls. Uh, then I had a piece for Paul Clay, which was a drum set rhythm study piece based uh, uh, off of sort of. His little cellular thing that he yeah yeah, yeah. no I can I can I can completely hear it <laughs> so um but do you see colors then or or is oh, it more yeah yeah I I have since I was very young oh see I envy that I wish I I wish I had that it's cool I mean it certainly is something that I draw upon sure and something that uh, I try to. Um, utilize to be able to get an understanding of what's going on texturally, uh -huh. you know, timbrely, uh, dynamically. So, so to me, a lot of it, it takes on visual significance and I can organize it visually. Right. 
right. and it will be organized sonically. But, but you're actually seeing colors, though. When you hear I'm something. actually seeing shapes, colors, textures, uh -huh. uh, yeah. sometimes uh, scenery. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. So, I don't know. It, it had a lot to do with, I think, growing up with a dad who was a visual artist and sure. that he turned us on to, you know, visual stuff pretty early. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, my my grandmother was very um, very into the visual arts, and actually, both my grandmothers were. So, you know, I, I have, you know, I, I have that sort of cultural background too. Maybe mm -hmm. not as I don't think as deep as is is yours. Um, but you know, there's like this whole thing. I'm trying to remember who it was. I want to say it's Rimsky Korsakov, but I don't think it is. Um, where he like like associated like I think D major with like kind of like a gold red or something like right. that. Right. So there's a few guys like that. Like Olivier Messiaen had right. a system based upon colors and chords and things like that. And I think that it's an interesting thing, Scriabin. I think also, but it yeah. but at the end of the day, it's so subjective. Right. You know, it's really each person can That's do how it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that doesn't mean that my blue gold is going to be the same as your blue gold. You're, you know. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I just was, I was just thinking about that because we're talking about this, and and I, 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 since I don't have that, and I, I recognize that it may not sound like that for other people, but it, it is something that it sort of sticks in the back of my mind at certain points. You know, it's I, I, t I tend to think more like texturally. You know. Um, like for instance, like Nels is somebody I always think sounds like Anselm Kiefer. <laughs> Cause he has like that, you know, or particularly when he was doing the early trio stuff, he just had like this really like gritty and then he's using the springs and all this stuff. And, you know, he was, you know, Nels really knows art. And to me it just, and I think that's somebody he really liked is, is you know, or Toppies, you know, those, some of those guys. And I think that, that some of that comes out in his playing. That's how I hear it, you know, at least. Well, how long was he uh, working at Arcana Books? Long time. You know, but, I mean, but he knew he knew his stuff anyway. I think you know I mean, he's a cultured dude. I mean, both of them are. Um, well, I think that that visual inspiration is a wonderful thing. You know, yeah. no matter how you process it, whether it's moving image, dance, you know, painting. Yeah. Sculpture, any of these these kinds of visuals that I think can get you going. Yeah, for sure. So my, my corollary about this though is that when I hear people play, I don't like to watch them play when I'm watching something when I'm hearing something live because I find it gets distracting. I'm not I'm paying more attention to the visual than I am to what I'm hearing. Occasionally I'll go like, oh, how do they make that sound? And I'll look and see how they made the sound. But a lot of times I just find it so, I'm not really, I feel like I'm not hearing it, I'm watching it. And, and for me, there's like a real, um, it's very difficult for me at certain points. Like, like, uh, like the whole idea of like people having video when they're playing, a lot of times the video and the, and the music, they're not really simpatico or, or it, they're, they, it's like they don't rehearse together. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they'll just show up and do it. So, so for me, like a lot of times, like, oh, they're doing great visuals, but I don't want to see it because it's not meshing with the music for me. Which know? is interesting because that's why, well, that, I'm saying that's why. That's why to me, this the Stan Brackage silent films are so quintessential because he's saying, no, there's nothing else. Just, right. look, just look at this. Right, and, and he's somebody I need to really know more about i i've i know the name but but i maybe have seen one or two things but you know but you know also the thing about in film music can be completely manipulative and it's like you know sitting at home in the pandemic you know it's like oh here's the music now i know how i'm supposed to feel before the actors even open their mouths you know oh here comes here comes the tear jerking it's like you know it it, it sort of cheapens the experience for both things, I think, in a way. I understand it's, you know, maybe the complete artwork and all that stuff, but to me, it's, it doesn't always work very well. I don't know. No. My, my beef, okay, sorry. <laughs> a little, little soapbox there. Um, 
So uh, yeah, we have to get Philip involved with you, me, and GE. I think, tour. <laughs> I think that would be great to do something with Philip Greenleaf, GE Stinson, you and myself. Yeah. And I think that uh, maybe it'll happen sooner than later. I hope so. I'm really um, kind of, I, I, I'm sort of champing at the bit. I'm sort of a little bit uh, trepidatious about getting out in the world because I just don't know what it's going to be like. Um, I've been thinking about trying to go to Berlin and maybe New York you know, in the spring next year, but I'm kind of like, is that really going to work? You know? Well, we don't know yet because that's, that's it's saying, month, yeah. month, you know, it's like, yeah, we want to plan for that, but we don't know yet. Yeah. We had Delta. When's Tau show up? <laughs> you know? I mean, I mean, seriously, it's like, you know, I'm trying to make plans and it's just like, I, I don't know if I can, you know? Hey brother. Well, it's, hopefully we're going to make music together soon. And I hope so. You know, whenever we do, something jumps off so yeah yeah i'm 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 excited about um getting out in the world with and with you in particular so you know if you're around in april and i decide to come out even if these other guys aren't out there they will do something and i'll bring a xylophone or a vibraphone this time <laughs> okay but if i'm out in new york you know then you're i'm just a hop skip and a jump away from you right yeah 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 well let's look forward to doing that and uh People can check out Stuart's music on the Cryptogramophone website. There are links to his music there, as well as StuartLiebig.bandcamp.com. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I looked at. I had to look it up today. Oh, good. And, and I'm not sure that. I mean, it's some of the stuff is also on um, YouTube. You know, it's like like the Minim stuff is on YouTube. Um, I think the Mentone stuff. We never talk about the Mentones, but that's okay. But uh, Joe Berardi, Tony Atherton, and Bill Barrett, and then Mentot with those two guys, plus Dan Klukas and Scott Ray, who are from the T-Talk Quartet. It's my whole sort of weird Americana meets avant-garde jazz thing. But that is on, uh, all that stuff's on uh, YouTube because PF Menem, CD Baby, YouTube. So like that, I'm pimping it, sorry. Um, cool. That's great, man. Thank you for having me. Isn't oh man, what a pleasure. I'm glad we had a chance to, to get into some of your world and uh thank you. And to to reconnect. Always always great to see you, Stu. Likewise, man. And you know, hang in. We're almost through it, I hope. <laughs> oh, well. Hanging in day by day is is my choice at the moment and we'll go yep. by that. Right so on. Thank you for listening to to the, to us chatter on about weird music and my guest has been Stuart Liebig. I'm Greg Bendian. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks. Bye.